Hello and welcome to Queer20, the cohort of 2023. Queer20 is Egomong's annual flagship program where we celebrate 20 exceptional queer Indians. Today we have with us Kinza Jamal. Kinza is an intersectional feminist, a certified social worker, painter and writer, advocating for issues like the prevention of gender-based violence and discrimination, foregrounding DEI and mental health and well-being. She is currently working at the YP Foundation, encouraging and ensuring a young feminist and rights-based approach within the organization and all, it, all of its processes. Without further ado, let's welcome Kinza. So I was reading one of your articles and you had mentioned this line that really stood out to me and you had said, in this contemporary world where people are constantly using words like intersection, inclusion and diversity, how should I tell them that bringing diversity is not being inclusive? Could you unpack this statement for us? Yeah. Uh, plus, thank you for starting with this question because uh, that piece in itself is a piece which is resistance for me against the systematic oppression. I called out a lot of places and systems I work in and used to work in and uh, and not even just work personally professionally what i've experienced is ki people are actively using words like intersectional inclusion diversity we give you equity but like in true life people really don't understand what actually this word intersection means inter be or being an intersectional feminist means uh, intersection like people bring these people who are coming from different communities marginalized communities they're minorities they're gender minorities they're coming to these spaces and what they experience is that they have to constantly prove their worth as they're constantly they because they come they came to these sp spaces after trying like after giving dual labor and they did not have access to the privileges other people had and they are given these uh, opportunities as a token they have to yeah. constantly prove that they're worthy of it they are not thought of that they are deserving of it but they they have to constantly prove that we have enough skills we have enough language we have enough uh, qualification to be here to be here whereas there are people in these spaces who are upper class who are holding senior positions who are holding amazing opportunities and these people who are coming who don't who don't have generational wealth who don't have uh, uh, who are coming because of uh, reservation and when they come to these spaces these people who are holding senior positions, they want these people to be exactly same like them. Yes. They want rem replication. They don't want inclusion. And I, I would also like to highlight if we go to the disability angle, there are people with chronic illnesses, people who are neurodivergent. So these spaces will say that we are neurodivergent, affirmative. These spaces are actually working on mental health policies but they're highly abusive. There is soft abuse, there is emotional abuse. So I don't like, with my experience of it and like, and this experiences I, my people around me have, it is not of inclusion or actually being intersectional. To be intersectional, you really need to give people spaces and understand them. That's yeah. what yeah. I want to say move beyond tokenism and actually be inclusive yeah yeah uh, beyond your professional role you're also a painter and writer how do these creative pursuits intersect with your activism and contribute to your overall impact as an lgbtq plus advocate so uh, beyond my professional uh, uh, portfolio i have uh, I've not used painting or writing as a monetary uh, thing for me because 
I don't want my art to be impacted or influenced by anyone. I try, uh, when I write, I try to make it as simple as I can. I try to write less jargons. I, and I usually use art and, and writing as a part of my life whenever I'm feeling very he heavy emotionally in any aspect. Like most of my uh, articles, if, if you have read, they are related to my grief or uh, my lived experiences or things I care about. So, and as being a, sorry, uh, being a, taking it with a queer lens that has always somehow benefited me to, you know, fully accept my identity because putting my work out there even if it's a little painting or it's a writing or an article being able as a queer muslim to put my work there it is a very big thing because there is no recognition there are no many not much representation of queer muslims specifically in india we can loudly say that we're Queer, uh, uh, it is very difficult to say this in our communities because there are extremists, but I think there are extremists in every community. Like, but when I put my work out there as an artist and a, uh, and a writer, it does give me a space to process my grief. And I would also like you to repeat the last part where you asked me the thing. Yeah, so how do these creative pursuits intersect with your activism? The, these uh, intersect with my activism in a lot of ways. Uh, like I'm able to express dissent. I'm able to share uh, my life and all the things I wanted to say to a lot of abusers, a lot of people, and because of systematic oppression, I was not able to because I was not in power. And, uh, but I really wanted to say what I wanted to because I don't want this world to, and I also want to deal with all of these things with the, because grief is basically love you have, and sadness or, and even anger is, a loss you experience so i want to do all of that but in a way where i can be kind i can be honest i can be myself and do it and it has worked really well for me when i process it and like put my work into activism there are people, there are people who came to me, who reached out to me after reading my articles or seeing my paintings. They have praised me. They have shared their lived experiences. They have shared how it is very difficult for them to be a queer Muslim, even in their families or with other people or not just queer Muslim, just being existing as a queer and asking for rights. I think this leads me to my third question, which is more about your writing. So your writing explores themes like domestic violence and the effects of fascist regimes. How do these experiences inform your understanding of resilience and LGBTQIA plus rights within a broader uh, social context? So if we start with domestic violence, so I believe that we all have encountered domestic violence. It doesn't have to be in a physical form or a sexual abuse form. Uh, we are brown people and we all have experience. Our culture is full of emotional abuse, which is not addressed. Uh, mm -hmm. I still see mental health campaigns and a lot of social media content uh, on the victim and it is not actually talking about the abusers we live with it is not asking for accountability from the system from patriarchy because family is the first institution which starts with the indoctrination 
which start with all the shame like the first time we experience shame is within our families so i do want to highlight that i do want to ask like i don't want to put all the burden on the victim yes victim has suffered a lot they need to heal and not be become an abuser but that is not the whole story i want people to be accountable for their actions how they have deeply impacted so many young people specifically queer community uh, queer community right now face a lot of domestic abuse they are pressured into marriages they there is forced rape there there is forced conversion also there there are a lot of uh, homophobia which is coming from the family that is something i really want to address that when i talk about domestic violence it is not just one kind of violence it is the cultural practices we have it is the habits we have it is the religious text we all have in our homes and it is feeding a lot of hate towards queer community and uh, if i start with the fascist regime right now just like i said it's just not easy to be a muslim right now in this country and uh, i am covering fascism right now because i don't believe that uh, you know people who are not muslim uh, doesn't hate or people who are muslim doesn't hate i believe that hate will only give us hate and if we don't actually work on it directly if we don't talk about kindness if we don't talk about radical love if we don't talk about how fascism has reached our hometowns our houses our shops our daily spaces how there is saffron everywhere how school how in schools my little cousins are experiencing uh fascism there is slogans everywhere people are getting bullied they are getting beaten up they are getting lynched i am scared to be a muslim i am scared to even give an expression of allah in a public space it is very difficult there are eyes everywhere i feel unsafe everywhere and the hate is excess right now minorities are not feeling safe at all and so that is why and i will be covering a lot of a uh, lot of more experiences from the ground which people around me are experiencing i am experiencing and i want to tell people ki even if we are not directly impacted we are living in a constant fear and no one hmm. deserves that i deserve to dream i deserve to hope for a better life but right now what i am getting is just i have paused everything because i don't know what will be the last day of me i don't know when i will get lynched for my identity would you say that being a queer is easier today than being a muslim yeah it is it is definitely easy i can i can go to spaces and be a queer person but i can't go to spaces and be a muslim yeah. being a muslim is extremely difficult right now uh as much as i want it to be easy for me uh yeah. plus it was uh, to be honest it was never easy to be a muslim like even for the jobs i apply i look at the spaces where i can get, uh, get that uh, opportunity on the basis of my qualification and not on my name because there are spaces who will not give me that job i cannot apply for uh, as i am a social worker i cannot apply for uh, government spaces because i know how highly dominated they are they they have directly said that will not give a job to a muslim so yeah. it is not restricted to just one space even accessing healthcare accessing like so many things 
this has been there like this fascist regime is not just impacting one aspect of safety but a lot of things which we don't even recognize there are so many queer people who are muslim who are not sharing their identities because it is right now really okay because people still have some acceptance or maybe not that much of acceptance but still being a queer is more okay for them but being a muslim is it's really difficult for them to even like accept me in any way mm. i can't mm. sit around a lot of people i can't work with lot of people i can't travel to a lot of spaces i need to be sure i have to map those spaces where i can access things as a trauma informed care advocate what do you see as the biggest challenges in fostering vulnerability and acceptance within the lgbtqia plus community and what actionable steps in your opinion can we take as a community to overcome these challenges and create more inclusive spaces the first form first thing which i want to say is a challenge is acceptance the stigma around lgbtqi community is very visible and it's just like for example i am an educated enough person to have an argument for myself i studied a lot to give an argument or make sure that i'm safe when i'm practicing or being just me uh but like the most terrifying thing right now is seeing teenagers seeing kids seeing a lot of young people who are queer and not having acceptance they are mocked they are bullied and the most stressing thing is the internalized homophobia and it is that much ki even poor people themselves who are starting to realize their identities are experiencing that homophobia and that is everywhere it is coming from uh uh from accessing healthcare to families to offices to corporate offices like the condition there is very bad they do have dni officers but it is not queer affirmative space is not queer. like even in language in hindi or in bangla or in uh, telugu we don't like we don't have words for non binary we don't have words for what queer is what lesbian is we don't have we use english words language is also a very big barrier when we look at it so this is the challenge yeah. and uh, some actionable points which i have uh, written i would like to speak about that uh, it's like the first thing is that we been bring inclusion in education systems and awareness uh, there is no mental health support in any institution whether it's school or it's in an office or in uh, in a hospital also there are no not a lot of uh, psychologist or uh, professional mental health professionals to give that support even if a kid is experiencing that that mental health professional is not queer informative enough to address that issue so that is there and uh, obviously we need to self reflect we need to even like we need to constantly see like how we can be a part of this one of the most important thing is that we process the lack of privilege and aspirations uh we need to acknowledge intersectionality and the complex layers of identities for example being queer and a muslim being queer and a dalit there are a lot of uh, layers into it and we need to understand the impact of these uh, lack of privileges and identities on our personal and professional lives we also need to you know continuously reflect on personal experiences and use them to f- fuel growth and empathy in professional settings and personal settings also actively and we need to disrupt the cycle for queer indians 
uh, as like for example this is an like this is a platform which i came across for the first time there are not a lot of spaces who are spreading awareness about queer, indian queers at all there are not a lot of spaces who are giving that space and voices and representation so amplify the voices and stories of queer indians to promote understanding and uh, dismantle stereotypes uh inclusive policies and programs advocate for inclusive uh, policies in workplaces and institution and ensure representation of diverse queer people uh and uh, mentorship programs develop mentorship programs for young queer uh, individuals to provide guidance guidance support and role models we really do need that yeah yeah, yeah. these are some um, actionable which i can think of and obviously making healthcare accessible for all it yeah. is not queer affirmative in any sense hmm hmm um uh so i w- i was reading an article and i came across uh, uh, your uh, uh, comment about how therapy did not really work for you and we always keep hearing about how therapy works for people can work for people but here is for, i think for the first time i heard someone tell on a public space like that openly that hey it did not so can you tell us why or how it did not and maybe if you had found the right therapist do you think it would have impacted you differently yeah we would like to share that experience because therapy and i had a very complex relationship <laughs> but yeah finally i have a good therapist but i'll come to it before uh, you know like i would like to talk about uh, uh, the ex- the bad experiences i had because of this uh, privileged space because uh there are therapists and psychology is a subject which is not accessible to a lot of uh, marginalized people it is a subject which is mostly accessed by people who can have the money to you know get that education so there are not many dalit queer or muslim people yeah. who can access psychology as a subject and become a psychologist yeah. so i did like i tried therapy with a lot of organizations i tried therapy with an rci licensed therapist i with experts and by the most difficult thing i was experiencing was they did not understand from where i was coming and it was very difficult to even express them it was very difficult to tell them that Yes, I live with Islamophobia also. It is not just about my OCD. Hmm. And there is a lot of grief. It was very difficult to tell them how complex uh, domestic violence was. There are like we are coming from a very traumatic spaces, and uh, it was really difficult for me to connect with them hmm. in that sense. So, and. Uh, specifically all of these therapists are not queer queer affirmative at all like if i was talking about my partner they were calling them friend they were not accepting that yes i can be in a relationship with the same sex uh they're not my friend when i'm actively saying that they are my partner and uh, there were times they will suggest you to you know subtly leave this or they will make uh queer relationships only about sex that they, mm. these people like maybe it's just the sex you want to explore sex you are obsessed about sex they will make you feel that you are an infomaniac apparently that is why you are queer and there is no such thing as being queer so there were spaces like this and these were people who have like degrees like they are rci licensed and they were doing this actively so it was really very difficult for me to connect with any therapist but now finally i have a therapist and before starting the therapy they did 
give me a consent form we did have a lot of conversations we did have sessions and we discussed about the current political scenario how it how and it is not just the indian politics it's everywhere islamophobia is everywhere so we did talk about a lot of things they did assure me by saying that yes i can never feel your experience i can't understand the uh, the depth of your grief but like, like i am well read i know uh, uh, what is systematic oppression how uh, how people are getting uh, abused on the basis of their identities i can assure you that i'm well read and uh, i can uh, support you in that way and like just knowing and obviously they were quite affirmative i checked that 